Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, Talks. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Dharani Bahmer, an assistant professor at the Center for Tobacco Research at The Ohio State University. TOPS is organized by Mike Pesco at the University of Missouri, C. Shang at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. This seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and the discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read out aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, C. Shang, from the Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Darni. Uh, today, we continue our winter spring 2024 season with a single paper presentation by Samuel Sturm entitled The Effect of Cigarette Taxes on Expenditures, Income, and Savings. This presentation was selected by a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Sam Sturm is a fourth year PhD student in the Department of Economics at Georgia State University. His research interests lie in applied microeconomics uh, with a focus on public economics, health economics, and the economics of crime. He is particularly interested in studying household decision-making in response to policy change. He is currently evaluating how households allocate financial resources when faced with tax policy changes, such as increases in cigarette taxes or more generous child tax credits. Reginald Hibbert, an economics PhD student at Georgia State University, is a co-author of the study and will answer select questions in the Q&A. Our discussion today is Michael Darden, an associate professor at Johns Hopkins University. Sam Sturm, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you, C. Um, no, I'm, I'm not muted. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, C. Uh, so this is joint work uh, between myself, uh, Chad Cotty at Michigan State, uh, Reginald E. Bear at Georgia State, Eric Nesson at Wake Forest, and Mike Pesco at the University of Missouri. Uh, this is a work in progress, so any comments or suggestions are encouraged uh, and will be really helpful and are very appreciated. Uh, so a real quick disclosure, uh, the research we're we'll talking about today uh, is supported by uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and the content that I will be discussing is solely the responsibility of myself and my co-authors and does not necessarily represent the official views of the NIH. Uh, and I personally have not received any tobacco-related funding over the past 10 years. Uh, I've never received any tobacco funding ever, but especially none over the past 10 years. Um, so this project uh, has a relatively simple research question, uh, and that's just, do cigarette expenditures increase as a result of cigarette excise tax increases? So do households spend more money on cigarettes uh, when cigarette taxes go up? Uh, and if they do, uh, what's the source of these extra dollars that are now going to be spent on cigarettes? Where are they coming from in the household budget? And so we're going to use exogenous variation in state cigarette taxes to estimate the effects on various consumer expenditures, uh, including cigarettes and uh, many other expenditures, uh, and then also income and savings. Uh, so why are we undertaking this project at all? Uh, well, the majority of tobacco consumption is in the form of cigarettes. And we know from a wide body of existing literature uh, that estimates for the pass-through of cigarette taxes are really high. They're between 80 and 120%, meaning that for every additional dollar of a cigarette tax, uh, cigarette consumers are spending an additional 80 cents to $1.20, um, which is to say that uh, cigarette consumers pay a lot of these cigarette taxes. 
And so if households are budget constrained uh, and we increase cigarette taxes, well, then they might cut spending elsewhere, uh, which would be affecting their overall consumption patterns. And depending on where these cuts occur, uh, this could have unintended negative or positive effects. And so understanding these consumption pattern effects is going to be critical for modeling the holistic effects of tobacco taxation. Uh, and to make that as clear as possible, um, we're going to go through like the seven things that we're theorizing a household could do, um, a budget constrained household could do, uh, who buy cigarettes when we see a tax increase in cigarettes. Uh, so they could discontinue their normal purchasing of cigarettes. Uh, and this would mean that they're going to just be straight up paying the tax on cigarettes. Uh, and if they engage in that behavior, they're going to have to do uh, one of the following six things. Um, or they can reduce purchasing of cigarettes. Uh, just, they could just reduce purchasing of cigarettes overall. Um, they could maintain their normal cigarette purchasing quantities, but purchase cheaper cigarettes or purchase cigarettes from a reduced tax source. So they could potentially uh, purchase cigarettes by the carton instead of by the pack, or they could cross state lines and purchase cigarettes from a state where the taxes are still low. Um, they could also just reduce expenditures of other tobacco products. Uh, so if they purchase both cigarettes and chewing tobacco, they could potentially just reduce the amount they spend on chewing tobacco to compensate for this increase in taxes. Um, they could also reduce expenditures of any other household items. Uh, and this is this point is of particular interest to us because we want to see if they're going to be allocating money that would have gone to some other spending category if they're instead taking that money and maybe allocating it to these increased price of cigarettes. Um, they could reduce savings. So if a household has a stock of savings, they could uh, go into those savings to get money to pay for these more expensive cigarettes. Um, or they could increase just their income overall by working more hours, potentially changing jobs, uh, just increasing the total stock of uh, income they have in order to meet uh, their budget constraint with this additional tax. Uh, so with full information about household expenditures, we are going to be able to observe whether and to what extent households engage in all of these spending decisions. Uh, and we're going to come back to this list multiple times throughout the presentation to kind of uh, check out as we evaluate each one of these potential household behaviors. Uh, so our setting here, uh, we're going to be looking at the United States from 1996 to 2022. And over this time period, we observed 227 different state-level cigarette excise tax changes. Um, state cigarettes range uh, right now from 17 cents to $5.01. So the, the state with the lowest cigarette tax has only a 17 uh, cents per pack tax on cigarettes. Or the states with the highest tax have a, over a $5 tax per pack on cigarettes. Um, and over our time period, over these 26 years, we're identifying um, within state cumulative tax changes range from no change at all to a change as large as $4.36. So some states are not changing their cigarette taxes over this whole period, and other states are changing their cigarette taxes as much as uh, $4.36. Uh, and so on the bottom left here, we have just the state average of cigarette taxes. Uh, in 1996, uh, we have something like uh, 40 cents per pack is kind of the average uh, state cigarette tax. Uh, and now in 20, the Q4 of 2022, uh, it's very close to $2. It's just under $2, like $1.96. Uh, and on the right here, I have uh, put states into like tax groups. Uh, so the blue line is representing states, the number of states that have uh, a cigarette tax between zero and $1. Uh, the orange is the number of states that have uh, taxes between one and $2, the gray two and three, the yellow three and four, and the green uh, four or more dollars. Uh, and so what I'm trying to show here is that like there were a bunch of states pre-2000 that had cigarette taxes that were below a dollar. Uh, and over time, that number has dropped considerably. And the number of states that have these higher cigarette taxes has increased uh, to now in quarter four of 2022, we have a wide variation in current state level cigarette taxes. Uh, so what do cigarette taxes have to do with non-tobacco spending? Well, we know that certain spending categories are going to be more flexible than others. Right? It might be easier to adjust spending on food or clothing, 
uh, than it would be to adjust spending on more rigid expenses like housing, which might be locked into a contract like a mortgage or a rental agreement. Um, and so spending diverted from some of these categories uh, is going to be less likely to impact human capital formation than spending on other categories. Uh, and so it's both the case that we're interested in spending diverted from some categories more than others, and it's the case that it's ambiguous, like which spending categories households are going to substitute from. Uh, so this paper is going to be the first to utilize a comprehensive account of total household spending uh, in the analysis of cigarette taxes. It's going to allow us to not only look at direct household effects on cigarette spending, but also evaluate changes in other parts of the household budget. All right, so the data we're going to be using is the Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Expenditure Survey, uh, specifically the interview survey uh, from 1996 to 2022. Uh, the Consumer Expenditure Survey is a nationally representative rotating panel survey collecting expenditure data on over 600 different categories of spending on goods and services. Uh, it's conducted by the BLS primarily uh, to calculate inflation levels. Uh, this is the data that the BLS uses to calculate things like the CPI. Um, that's the primary reason why it exists. Uh, so each household is going to be tracked up to four times at three-month intervals. So they're tracked, they're uh, interviewed once per quarter for four quarters uh, to obtain 12 months of expenditure data. Uh, and then once the household has been interviewed four times over four quarters, they're going to be dropped from the survey uh, and then replaced by a new household. Uh, so the households are pre-screened and contacted by the BLS to ensure that a qualified adult respondent is going to be present for each of the survey appointments, each of the interviews. Uh, and these interviews typically are in person and last a little more than an hour. Um, and again, like I, I said, the primary reason for this data existing is for the BLS to calculate uh, things like the CPI. Um, and so they're primarily interested in urban and suburban households. Um, and so we do have really sparse response in some of the particularly rural states, states like Montana, uh, the Dakotas, Wyoming, uh, Idaho. Um, and so due to sparse responses in some of these more rural states, we're going to focus on the interviews conducted in 35 states and Washington, D.C. Uh, and so an example of what these consumer expenditure interview questions would look like um, just across some broad categories is, uh, a question here, like, since the first of a given month, not including this month, have you or any members of your household paid for any babysitting, nanny services, or other child care inside or outside of your home? Uh, and so then the interviewee will answer yes or no to this question, and then they'll get a follow-up question that says, well, how much do you spend uh, per week or per month on this, uh, on this expenditure? And the BLS takes that information and then uses it uh, to calculate what their spending is uh, per household for this household for that quarter. Uh, so an example of this for the cigarettes question would be like, how much does your household usually spend each week for cigarettes? So they're being asked, how much do you spend per week? Uh, and then they're reporting from that weekly number an imputed uh, quarterly spending. Uh, so the consumer expenditure does have some limitations. Uh, of the 13,000 households that the BLS contacts every quarter, uh, they receive five to 6,000 usable interviews per quarter. So about 40% of households contacted will become a usable interview. Uh, and that is that corresponds to 20 to 24,000 different interviews per year. Uh, again, it's heavily urban focused. And to be clear by urban here, we mean just not rural, like suburban would also count in here. Um, and one reference person is going to be in, in this interview is going to be reporting expenditures for the whole household over the past quarter. Um, and so there could be some concerns about uh, how accurate this measure is, uh, because the one person was reporting for multiple people in a household. And how well are they remembering over the past three months uh, of their expenditures? Uh, however, our identification strategy here is going to reduce the potential for measurement error to bias our results. Uh, as long as this measurement error is not going to be correlated with the passing of cigarette taxes, uh, we shouldn't see a problem because of this measurement error. Uh, and also a, a huge benefit of the CE is that it has really consistent measures of expenditures, uh, income and savings over this whole period from 96 to 2022. 
Like some of these questions that they're asking, they've asked the exact same question uh, every single quarter uh, to all these households for this entire 26 year period. So it's a really, really consistent survey, which is really valuable for this project. Uh, so some descriptive statistics, uh, the CE is pretty representative of the United States as a whole. Uh, in most ways, uh, we have about 50%, slightly more than 50% of the respondents uh, are female, about 80% are white, about 13% are black, which again corresponds roughly to uh, US population as a whole. Uh, we have 98% urban, which again, urban here corresponds to just being not very rural. Uh, so urban and suburban areas will both count, even like many exurban areas would be counted as urban by the BLS. Uh, so that would be the one place though that the, the CE is less representative of the United States as a whole. Um, we have about two and a half people per household in this data. Um, and just because we're going to be looking at tobacco and cigarettes, we'll say we see about $74 uh, on average for a quarterly spending for a household on tobacco. Uh, and of that $74 spending on tobacco, about 60, uh, 68 of those dollars are going to be spent on cigarettes. Um, so 18% of the respondents are going to resport, report spending on cigarettes. So like 82% of people responding to the survey do not spend any money on, on cigarettes. They likely don't smoke. Um, so conditional on people spending money on cigarettes. So just looking at that 18% of the, the CE respondents who do spend money, uh, they spend an average of $375 on cigarettes per quarter. Um, and we're seeing uh, 588,000 interviews over this whole time period. So here are some examples of the, the major spending categories that BLS identifies uh, in the CE. Right? So we have things like uh, food at home, food away from home. Uh, we have housing. Uh, and on, on the right side of this column are these average quarterly spending per household. Um, and so we're seeing here, for example, like housing, uh, we're seeing households are spending about $4,000 per quarter on housing. So about $1,300, $1,400 a month on housing. Uh, so that'd be rent or a mortgage payment, anything like that. Um, for education, for example, again, we're seeing uh, $240 being spent per quarter. Um, healthcare, $785 per quarter, um, things like this. Okay. Um, so these categories defined by the BLS are these kind of most broad categories, but each one of these categories uh, have more granular subcategories within them. Um, so for example, like within entertainment, we can observe like how much money people are spending on theater tickets specifically. Um, and so these are really just the most broad uh, 14 different categories that the BLS identifies, but within them, uh, we find all the subcategories and that's what makes up the 600 different goods that we're saying uh, the CE is, is asking about in this interview data. Uh, the other data sort we're gonna be using is from the Tax Burden on Tobacco report. Um, this is data that's including federal and state level information regarding taxes uh, and the price, the average price of tax paid sales of cigarettes. Um, which is reported on an annual basis. Uh, here we're seeing like the weighted average price per package uh, of tax paid uh, cigarettes that are, so cigarettes that are, are bought within a setting where the tax is, is being paid. So a typical like uh, gas station or, or market of that sort. Uh, we're seeing a mean of about five and a half dollars being spent on cigarettes per pack since the year 2000. Um, and we're seeing taxes being something like 35% of that price uh, since 2000. Um, and our sales per uh, quarter per state uh, is 307 million packs uh, sold. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and, and take a pause here for any questions on the data or motivation. Thank you. Um, so let's turn to our discussion, uh, Michael, to see whether he has any comments. Thank you, C. That, uh, that was great, Sam. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so I think it's a really important paper. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're probably in the tobacco control literature and in the economics, we're, we're probably too quick to assume that taxes are either going to cause smoking cessation or they're simply just going to be paid by the smokers and, you know, nothing else happens and they generate revenue and that's 
that's great. But, you know, of course, in a kind of a, like a larger welfare sense, uh, you know, it's not clear that cigarette taxes are, are welfare improving. We know that cigarette smokers are increasingly relatively low SES folks in this country. We know that menthol smokers, for example, are overwhelmingly African-American. Uh, we, we know that there's an increasing urban rural gap, you know, and so it's, it, it's it, it, in that context, you know, a dollar lost of wealth for those people has a big utility uh, cost, for the, you know, bigger than, bigger than for most. And so um, I think this paper is really helpful, at, at, you know, as a good first step at kind of thinking about the broader implications of cigarette taxes. Um, I really liked your uh, slide where you list like all of the possible things that you you know you you were thinking of of um, that might might be happening. Um, <clears throat> I think from an from an economist perspective, I was a little bit confused because a lot of those were non mutually exclusive, right? Like like you could uh, see uh, continue of normal purchases, but for that to be true, you know, then the person might have to work more or something like that. Like. Um, uh, yeah, given a budget constraint. So I was wondering if you could just comment um, on like the normal versus inferior status of cigarettes in your mind. So like if you take just the first one, continue normal purchases, um, you know, if, if, if that were the only thing that happened, right, then, then cigarettes would have to be an inferior good because we'd substitute away from cigarettes, but then the income effect would, would kind of suggest that they had to consume more cigarettes. So um, uh, can you just, can you, you know, and then, and then furthermore, if you kind of go down like a couple of these, you know, you know you're talking about differentiated products, um, you know, where maybe people substitute towards lower quality cigarettes or, or something like that. So I think they're just like multiple models that are going on here. And, and uh, your motivation for the paper was cigarette taxes might be uh, you know, welfare harming in some sense. And so I, I didn't really have a model in my mind of, of what you were thinking. Can, can you comment on that? Yeah, so we're not going to take a specific stance on whether or not we think cigarettes are going to be a, a normal <laughs> or inferior good, um, kind of for the exact reason that we think all these things are, are just possible. Um, and maybe like once we find evidence of any of these particular behaviors, we could we could show that maybe they are potentially inferior if we see a lot of people like discontinually smoking uh, cigarettes, but taking consumer consumption from other places. Um, and so like the main idea here of just this bolded list is not so much to lay out like a specific model of uh, consumer behavior, uh, but just to note that when you are budget constraint, um, that you're going to be facing a choice. And given that choice, like what, what is actually uh, the response there is kind of really, really up for debate. Like we've not, we've not looked at uh, this kind of question before of what happens to, to these expenditures uh, that are not directly cigarette related. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it could be potentially the case that cigarettes are, are this inferior good or this normal good. Um, but our goal here is is kind of maybe to to potentially motivate future research to to answer that question. Um, least... Yeah, I mean, okay. So the extent to which you're gonna kind of put that off to future research is is fine. I think I think if if you could lay out some kind of uh, testable hypotheses from a model that that would increase the ceiling of the paper, um, and and I'll, I'll leave that comment there. Um, but I think you know generally the the um, the, the data are quite appropriate for this and they're very interesting. Um, you mentioned that the data have a panel aspect to them. Uh, yeah. Are you gonna use that panel aspect? So the fact that you observe the same people in four different quarters, uh, is there any information that you can glean from, from that variation within individual or within family? Uh, so for the results that we're gonna show today, uh, we do not, use any aspect of it being a panel. However, we do have uh, some models, which are very similar to the ones that we run, where we utilize a household fixed effect. And so essentially, we're only looking at uh, the households who we observe within a state where we see that cigarette tax change. Um, and estimates from those models are very, very similar to the estimates that I'm going to be showing today. Great. OK. Um, and then one more question. So I mean, in any time you're working with expenditures, including cigarettes, but I'm sure all of these things. 
the distributions are like highly skewed, right? So like there, there are a lot of people that if you if you if you just plot the histogram of it, like every one of those expenditure categories, right? They probably none of them probably look normal. So are you going to try to account for that in your regressions? Uh, so one of the benefits of using the really broad categories is that they are a little bit more normal than kind of these individual, uh, more granular categories. Like if you look at spending on, like, for example, clothing for women is one of the categories, like, uh, then yeah, you do see this is a, a dramatic number of people, like most households are spending zero, and then some households are spending a ton. Right. Um, so part of the reason why and what we're going to be looking at are just the really, really big categories of these things that almost all households are spending money on uh, is, is for that exact reason. Like almost all houses we're observing are they're spending some money on clothes. Almost all houses we're observing are spending money on on food and on things like housing. So yeah, yeah, we don't really we don't these issues because of the the huge categories that we're looking at. Yeah. But in the context of smoking, then I mean the extensive margin is interesting as well. Right. So maybe a two part model or something on smoking. Uh, yeah. So we do look at um, the extensive model and some of the the okay. things we don't have. I don't, I don't know if we present those results, um, but we don't necessarily see huge changes in the extensive side. Uh, it seems to be primarily people are changing intensive, like they're changing number of packs smoked. But okay. I, I really show those okay. results. I'll kick it back to C for. Thank you. Uh, so I see Raji is answering some questions. Uh, so I'll read you the question that he's not uh, replying. So the first one is from Moses uh, Talibota. So I'm going to uh, reinterpret what I guess uh, he or she is trying to ask. So there are cigarettes that are distributed to the public by the manufacturers, and they may be correlated with uh, the uh, people or consumers characteristics so and how frequent they use uh the smoke cigarettes so can you know if all manufacturers are um like imported and whether you can match them i guess that's my interpretation so hopefully i get uh, the good question right so i guess so can you match the cigarette types based on the household characteristics uh, so no, we're not going to be able to see like the exact types of cigarettes that people are smoking and the ways in which they're getting those cigarettes. That's something we're not going to be able to look at. Uh, and, and we will mention that again later in the presentation of the the seven different things that we are describing households could do um, when faced with cigarette taxes. One of them is they could just smoke a, a cheaper brand or acquire cigarettes through some other means. Uh, and we'll get into some other literature that does look at that question, but given the limitations of the data we're using, we, we cannot answer that directly. Uh, okay, so there is another uh, question uh, from Amos uh, Hausner. So uh, when a tax increase, uh, manufacturers or retailers reduce the price uh, in order to keep consumption high, is this taken into account in the study? Uh, so we are going to be looking at units of cigarettes sold over time, uh, which isn't, we're able to just look at packs instead of uh, just the actual price being paid. Um, but in terms of seeing if on the firm side, on the supply side of cigarettes, if these uh, companies are, are reducing prices in direct response to cigarette taxes, uh, that's another thing that we're not going to be able to, to look at directly given our data. Thank you. Um, I think those are all the open questions. Please continue. Thank you. Uh, so the estimation strategy that we're going to use uh, is difference and differences. Uh, this is the most widely used uh, quasi-experimental like uh, approach uh, in applied economics. Uh, you guys have maybe seen it before, or maybe not, but the uh, essential idea here is we're just going to be looking at differences in trends between a, a treatment and a control group. Um, and in this case, our treatment group is going to be a state that's experiencing a tax change, uh, where the control group will be states that are not experiencing tax changes. Um, and so our, our treatment effect, our estimate is it's going to be uh, these differences in trends between the treatment um, and a counterfactual treatment, which we're going to be able to get an idea of what that would look like from 
uh, our estimation of the control group. Uh, so the standard uh, difference and difference method is relying on parallel trends and a single period binary treatment. Uh, we do not have a single period binary treatment. As I said, we see 227 uh, different tax changes over this 26 year period we're looking at. Um, and so our environment is, is not going to work with just the basic difference and differences. Uh, and so instead, we use uh, the de Chase Martin de Foy dynamic difference and difference estimator, uh, which allows us to, to account for these differences in our, in our setting. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to categorize the nominal excise taxes in these $1 thresholds. So uh, we're saying what is a state's uh, current nominal excise tax, uh, and we're going to bin it. Uh, either it's between zero and one dollar per pack, it's between one and two, two and three, three and four, or more than four dollars per pack. Uh, and then we're going to examine states which are switching from one of these bins uh, to another bin, uh, and then using the states that were in that previous bin as the comparison. So, for example, if a state goes from a tax of two dollars and fifty cents to a tax of three dollars and twenty cents. Um, we're going to observe them moving from the two to three dollar bin to the three to four dollar bin, uh, and then we're going to use the other states in the two to three dollar bin that do not experience tax change as the control group for that state. And so this is going to allow us to account for staggered adoption uh, as well as uh, continuous variation in treatment. The fact that our treatment has different level has different magnitudes of of effects, right? The, not all taxes. The difference between going from a zero and one dollar tax to a two and three dollar tax is not the same as the difference between going from a zero to one dollar tax and a three to four dollar tax. Uh, so by categorizing our taxes in these bins, uh, it does come at the cost of losing some variation. Like, like I said, we observe 227 tax changes, uh, but only 145 of these tax changes actually take a state uh, from one bin to the next bin, which is what we're identifying as our, our treatment. And so we're only observing 145 of these tax change events as treatment, um, which we're not concerned that we're not be able to capture all of these uh, just because uh, we think this is going to create like an attenuation bias. So it should, it should downward bias our estimates of the effects of cigarette taxes. Um, and so any statistically significant effects that we find um, we're not going to be like overstating the effect we're finding. At worst cases, are going to be understating. Um, so state is our unit of analysis and quarter is our unit of time variation. Uh, and we have policy controls for cigar taxes uh, and demographic controls for sex, race, urban status, uh, and family size. Um, so I think Michael wanted to have uh, one other pause here so we can ask you some questions about the uh, methodology. Thank you. So I think uh, let's turn to Michael first. Uh, I actually actually have a question. So <laughs> maybe the same, you know. Uh, so I'll let Michael ask first. Um, sure. Yeah. I. I. Um, no. I think it's the appropriate uh, uh, estimator, and and you do a really nice job of of explaining it. Um, I'm, I, I guess I'll, I, I think somebody put this in the Q&A, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, uh, how are you thinking about e-cigarette tax changes during this period? Or is it just not relevant because of the time period? Uh, or is it um, uh, something that you don't think would bias your results? Yeah, so it's both. Uh, we would like to look at uh, e-cigarette expenditures over the whole time also. Um, but the one I'll note that the CEE data doesn't ask about uh, e-cigarettes until 2018. Uh, and around the same time is also when we start seeing major policy, uh, these tax changes on e-cigarettes also. Um, and often just in the past, then 2018, 2019 uh, and on, um, we see that e-cigarette taxes are often like contemporaneous with uh, normal cigarette taxes. And so uh, we just like for the, the last couple of years of our observation, um, if we just control for these e-cigarette taxes, it, it possibly would be accidentally controlling for uh, the cigarette taxes as well. Um, 
But since the vast majority of our uh, cigarette tax variation is kind of in the period from 2000 to 2015 or so, uh, I don't think it creates a huge issue for our estimate. Okay, great. Um, and it, just one other question. So, I mean, it, you know, you're talking about like the price of cigarettes that people have to pay going up. But, it, you know, in, in some theoretic sense, it re what really matters is kind of the relative price of cigarettes to the kind of general price level of all these other expenditures that you're talking about. And so I would like, it'd be helpful if you kind of thought of, like clarified for me exactly what you're assuming in terms of other price changes um, during this period. And particularly as it relates to why cigarette taxes are enacted in the first place. So, you know, you could imagine that a state is implementing a cigarette tax to generate revenue because of some economic downturn or something like that. Um, and, and that downturn would be correlated with um, the price level, essentially. Uh, and so cigarette taxes in a relative sense might increase the price of cigarettes, but they might also decrease it relative to everything else. Um, so I, I guess what I'm what I'm concerned about here is measurement error. And, and you said that you're controlling or capturing measurement error through your, your estimator. So if you could just comment on that, that'd be great. Um, so I'll say we don't control for the economic environment like of, of the state and the, the quarter, uh, which is uh, potentially a really good suggestion that I think we'll look at in the future. Um, but specifically, like we look at nominal cigarette excise taxes here, uh, kind of specifically for this reason, is that when we see these these major changes in like in the nominal cigarette taxes, that represents uh, like a discrete jump in the cigarette tax. And so, like unless uh, contemporaneously to that discrete jump, uh, there is a large price change in other things, like right at that same time. Uh, then we wouldn't expect there to be any kind of bias in our results. Like, and because we're looking at all of these discrete jumps over time uh, within states, so we're not looking at like uh, staggered treatment across you know groups of states that all have uh, similar uh, tax changes all at once. Like all these, there's very very few cases where we have multiple states who have a tax change in the same year and quarter. Um, and so I, I think in that way, like we're not necessarily going to be capturing. Uh, like changes in prices over time uh, as being like, relevant to the the relative cost of cigarettes. Like every single time we're observing a treatment, it's a it's a drastic, uh, discrete change in the relative price of cigarettes uh, from where they were uh, and from where they will be after the tax, and also where they were in comparison to other goods and where they will be in comparison to other goods after the tax. If that makes sense. So that's a good answer. Great. See, you can. Yeah, okay. so I think I have a very quick question. Thank you. So, so what's the advantage here of uh, using dynamic difference in difference rather than traditional one? Because my impression is that uh, the staggered uh, adoption of policies, you know, those type of uh, policies that they tend to have very different effects, but we are looking at pricing here. And um, in the economics, we have a, a lot of methods to make like, you know, prices uh, comparable across different time um, and across different regions. For example, you can use like regional CPI to adjust the prices so prices can be comparable. And we have the CPI to adjust inflation so prices are comparable. So I'm, I'm just wondering, like we have all these tools to make price comparable. And uh, to me, like this is one thing that I feel uh, would be found by most consumers. So I'm wondering what's the benefits here using that dynamic? Uh, so the benefit is that we don't have to assume at any point while using this, uh, the Chase Martin DeFoy estimator, uh, that like the difference between cigarette taxes of similar magnitudes are going to be the same. Like We don't have to assume the difference between a $1 cigarette tax to a now $2 cigarette tax is going to be the same as the difference between a $3 cigarette tax and now a $4 cigarette tax. And so because we allow for these like different magnitudes of, of treatment, or this estimator allows us to account for these different magnitudes of, of treatment. So that's like the primary advantage and, and why we're choosing uh, this DCDH over any of the other many uh, new staggered treatment effect difference and difference estimators that all kind of came on the scene in the past two years in applied economics. 
Um, yeah, I guess what I'm hoping is just to, to have some method paper to show the advantage. But anyways, um, please uh, go ahead with um, your presentations to have some slides and results to show. Thank you. Um, so our first set of, of results are kind of our main results here. Um, is going to where table is going to show the average treatment effect of an additional one dollar of cigarette taxes on cigarette spending. So this is the average treatment effect of a state transitioning uh, from one bin to the next bin up. Um, and we observe that households in states with a, a one dollar increase in cigarette taxes raise their spending on cigarettes uh, by seven dollars and eighteen cents, which is approximately ten percent, um, given the baseline of sixty-seven dollars and seventy-five cents. Um, and again, I'll note we have an average uh, price per pack of cigarettes is something like five dollars, uh, and so an additional dollar of cigarette taxes is much larger than a ten percent increase in the total cost of a pack of cigarettes. Um, and so our, our back of the envelope calculation is that the, using the average tax paid price of cigarettes uh, is that this corresponds to roughly an eleven percent decrease in packs purchased. Right, so the households are spending ten percent more, uh, but the tax is looking like something of a of twenty percent increase um, in the price, and so spending ten percent more in light of a twenty percent increase in price, we're going to say corresponds to something like an eleven percent decrease in units purchased per household per quarter. Uh, and so our event study is uh, as follows: Here we have uh, no evidence really of pre-trends. Uh, except potentially for the couple of quarters uh, right before the tax change. Uh, and we think that this might be evidence that people are, are hearing about the tax, like the tax uh, policy might have been passed in the legislative body, uh, but not enacted for another couple of quarters. And so uh, potentially consumers are like stocking up on cigarettes at this lower price. Um, but outside of those two quarters, we have no evidence of, of pretrends. Um, and again, our, our average treatment effect here is $7.18 uh, additional per quarter spent per household on cigarettes. Uh, we do have some heterogeneity on these estimates. Um, we see a much larger effect for households that had female respondents to the survey uh, and much larger effect for white households than we did for non-white households. Um, additionally, we had a larger effect for households that were larger than the median household size that we observed than we did for households that are, are smaller than the median household size we observed. Um, we do not stratify using income, because uh, if you if you remember the uh, list of bullet points that I presented that we will come back to in just a second, uh, one of our considerations is that households might be adjusting their income in response to these cigarette taxes. Uh, and so we don't want to stratify on an endogenous this variable. Uh, so going back to our, our checklist of possible things, um, we say households continue normal purchases, uh, that we do see evidence of higher spending, which is implying that at least some consumers are continuing normal purchasing uh, and in fact paying these higher taxes. But like we said, um, we also, from our back of the envelope calculation, uh, see that the increase in expenditures is not commiserate with the increase in the price per pack in percentage terms. So at least some households are not continuing from purchases. Uh, and so we use then the tax burden on tobacco data to look at cigarette unit sales uh, per state per quarter. And so then our average treatment effect of this additional dollar of cigarette taxes uh, corresponds to a 16 million uh, pack reduction per state per quarter. Uh, and then from our mean of 307 packs sold per state per quarter, uh, this is approximately a 5% decrease. Um, so it's a relatively similar magnitude to our back of the envelope calculation from the expenditure data that yes, uh, households are purchasing uh, less packs of cigarettes even if they may be spending more money on cigarettes in total. Uh, and our event study here uh, also shows like a, a very, very clear decrease uh, in packs sold every quarter um, per state. And so back to our checklist, the reduced purchases of cigarettes, uh, we do have evidence that there are at least less cigarettes being sold 
Um, and again, from our back of the envelope calculation, we think that we see households not necessarily spending enough money to uh, continue full normal purchases, uh, at least some households aren't. So we do find some evidence that households are in fact reducing their purchases of cigarettes in response to cigarette tax increases. Um, and we also look at spending, uh, this is now spending categories for the rest of the presentation, we're looking at spending categories that are not just only cigarettes. And so we're gonna start with other forms of tobacco, so non-cigarette forms of tobacco. Uh, and we find that a $1 increase in cigarette taxes, uh, while not having a statistically significant effect on this kind of other tobacco spending. So again, these are uh, tobacco products like chewing tobacco, snus, things like this. Um, we don't find a statistically significant evidence uh, of a downward effect, but we do have a uh, negative effect. Uh, and also, I'll note that the average spending on other tobacco products in the consumer expenditure data is only $6.73. Uh, and so it's really hard to get a precise estimate on this because there's just not a lot of people spending money on these products uh, in our data. Um, but uh, I'll say a $4 decrease uh, per quarter when the average is only $6 is a pretty significant decrease. Um, and you can see our kind of the reason why we're not able to get a significant decrease here is that even though in our event studies, we were showing a, a very clear like downward trend in this other tobacco spending, uh, we just don't have very precise estimates. And again, that's mostly just because uh, there's very few households uh, spending lots of money on these kind of non-cigarette tobacco. products. Again, we have a, an average treatment effect here though of negative $4.20 per quarter. Uh, that is not statistically significant. Uh, so this would cover our kind of fourth possibility of plausible household responses to cigarette tax increases, um, that households may reduce expenditures in other tobacco products, right? Uh, we think that's plausible. We certainly can't rule it out, um, but our estimates are not statistically significant at our conventional levels. Um, and so then we look at, uh, in each one of these columns or individual uh, regressions, we're looking at, well, what is the effect of these cigarette taxes on all of our other major BLS spending categories? Um, and we find significant decreases in spending for the categories of apparel and the categories of cash contributions. Uh, and cash contributions include things like uh, money given to charity, money given to educational causes, um, money given to a like college student uh, that may be like your, your dependent, these sorts of things. Uh, and so we, we do find significant decreases in spending in these categories. Um, and both of them are somewhere in the realm of about 10% decrease. Uh, and we don't find any other changes uh, that are statistically significant or economically meaningful in any of the other categories. Um, but these are some of the categories that we might expect to be kind of the most flexible. Uh, it's like this charity giving um, and spending on clothes. These are the two expenditures that are both large uh, large portions of average household spending and uh, expenditure categories that, you know, people are not necessarily contracted into, into spending money every single month, every single week on. Um, and so we don't think it's a, it's a coincidence that both, both of these two categories are the ones that we're finding significantly negative effects on. Um, we think it's, it's, quite, it's quite plausible that these are just two categories that people are deciding to cut back on. Uh, in order to compensate for increases in cigarette taxes. Uh, and so the possibility of reducing expenditures of other household items, uh, we do find evidence that apparel and cash contributions are reduced by about 10%. Uh, and then we also look at the effects on the household savings. Uh, so the BLS uh, consumer expenditure interview uh, question on savings is specifically like what is the current amount of money that you have in a savings account? And uh, so this is a, a stock, not a flow, uh, but either way, we don't see a major difference in savings over time uh, corresponding to these, these tax changes. We don't have any real reason to believe that households are pulling money uh, to any significant extent out of their savings uh, in order to afford more expensive cigarettes. Uh, so the possibility of households reducing savings, we're gonna say, uh, we don't necessarily find evidence of that behavior. Um, 
And then also we want to look at the effect of uh, the cigarette taxes on income, like our, our households deciding to go out of the way to work more hours or to make more money in some other way um, in order to afford more expensive cigarettes. And we do not find evidence of that either. Um, and so for our uh, sixth bullet or seventh bullet point here, our, our plausible household responses to cigarette tax increases, uh, we're going to say that we don't find any evidence that households are increasing their income or working more hours in response to cigarette tax increases. Uh, so we skipped over, if you notice, our third bullet point, which is that households might purchase cheaper cigarettes or get cigarettes from a reduced tax source. And I already answered some questions that kind of get at this. Um, but a direct examination of consumer behavior regarding brand switching or like potentially getting lower cost cigarettes from some other source is not within our capability using this consumer expenditure data. We are not able to identify like what exact type of cigarettes they're buying or where they're buying them from. Uh, but there is existing research showing evidence that consumers may engage uh, in this kind of behavior, uh, specifically purchasing by the carton rather than by the pack, uh, choosing cheaper brands, using coupons, um, either supplied by the manufacturer or just coupons supplied by uh, the retail entity, um, or utilizing low or non-tax sourcing, i.e. Um, cross-state purchasing or purchasing cigarettes from uh, kind of non-legal means. Uh, so smuggled cigarettes, things like this. Uh, we there do There is evidence in literature that people do, in fact, utilize these sort of cigarette sources uh, in response to higher cigarette taxes. Uh, so to return back to our checklist of possible things, the ways that households could respond to cigarette taxes, uh, we cover all of them, or at the very least, uh, all of them except for point three, which we claim there is also evidence that exists um, to kind of get at, at that particular point. But we see that uh, households do, in fact, consume uh, at least a little bit or spend a little bit more money, I should say, on cigarettes, uh, but potentially consume less packs. Um, we see that households possibly do reduce expenditure of other tobacco products. We see that households uh, do possibly reduce expenditure on specific categories of other household expenditures. Um, and we don't find evidence that households are reducing savings or increasing income. Uh, so our this evidence here that we found is highlighting a, a nuanced response among consumers. Uh, so following a $1 tax increase, the kind of main headline result is that there's a notable 10% rise in quarterly spending on cigarettes by consumers, moving them from a pre-treatment mean of uh, $67.75 uh, to $74.93. Uh, and this increase in spending is observed alongside a 5% decrease in cigarette sales uh, per pack, per state, per quarter, um, suggesting that while consumers are spending more money due to the tax, they're likely purchasing fewer cigarettes overall. Uh, we find a decrease in non-cigarette tobacco spending uh, that is statistically significant, insignificant, um, but again, we think it might suggest an economically significant negative effect. We just don't necessarily have the precision to get at that exact, uh, that exact spending category. Um, and additionally, uh, a note, as I did uh, in response to, to Michael and just, to, just a second ago, um, that we do run these De Chase Martin de Foy models incorporating household fixed effects where we're um, essentially only looking at households that we're observing over the course of the uh, tax treatment. And these results are really very similar to the ones that I've presented to you guys today. Uh, we also find no noticeable change in household savings or gross income levels post-tax increase, uh, indicating that the additional tax burden is not significantly altering uh, these financial indicators. Um, we also find the critical human capital bidding expenditures, uh, the ones that we really would care the most about, things like food, housing, education, and healthcare, uh, are probably largely unaffected by cigarette tax increases, which would be uh, good news for policymakers. Um, However, there do appear to be some adjustments within more flexible household expenditure categories like apparel or cash contributions. And we do think that these may reflect consumers' efforts to reallocate spending in a response to increased cost of cigarettes uh, in light of a, of a household budget constraint. Uh, so for future research, we would like to disaggregate our current spending categories, which are using the, the current spending categories that are composed by the BLS. 
Uh, we like to disaggregate them in ways that may more appropriately group together human capital formating, formation activities, right? So instead of just looking at one of these large uh, pre-created 14 categories, we could piece together from the more granular categories just the types of things that we think would be uh, creating uh, human capital, like households would use to, to increase their long-term human capital. Uh, we think that might actually get a little bit better, that might be a little bit better way to address our question of directly looking at, well, is this possibly having an unintended effect, unintended consequence that's either positive or negative. Um, we'd also like to explore a household fixed effect model specification where we're stratifying by a baseline smoking status uh, in the initial interview. So we would like to, to kind of rerun these models where we're identifying some households as spending money on cigarettes or tobacco uh, in the first interview, uh, and then we're observing them over the course of a tax change. And so we can identify that like this house is in fact a house that is plausibly uh, contains a smoker uh, compared to other houses that maybe plausibly do not contain a smoker. Um, and so that's it for uh, what I have to present today. Uh, I will go ahead and, and hand it off to uh, C or, or Michael so that we can I can answer some questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Very interesting results. Uh, let's turn to Michael first to see whether he has any questions. Yeah, I mean, just one one question in the couple of minutes we have. I mean, I, I found your results by edu um, sorry by gender to be pretty interesting. Um, uh, do you have a story for for why it is that the effects are so much larger for um, for one than the other? Uh, so I'll, I'll note that. This is the gender of the person who's responding to the interview survey. So it could totally be the case that it's like a, a couple where there's a man and a woman, um, and the man is maybe the smoker. Um, and so it, it could be the case that um, maybe the respondent is going to be like differentially more likely to uh, claim that they are smoking cigarettes, like if there could be differences by sex and like accuracy of, of this, the response. Um, also, a note that we do see broadly uh, slightly more spending um, on cigarettes for these households that are being uh, that have female respondents, uh, which is also a little unusual. Um, so it, it, we think it, it might just be mostly the fact that these households are maybe a little bit more accurate in their cigarette expenditure reporting. Um, but other than that, we don't have any any clear idea. And we also found that like particularly weird. Yeah, I was really surprised by that. And I, I mean, I wonder if it's valuable to report it, given that there are multiple things that could be going on. It's just very difficult to interpret. Um, uh, and I guess the only other thing I'll, I'll ask is um, in that in that one table where you looked at, I think, 14 different expenditure categories. I mean, I, I think just statistically, we would expect to see one of them to be statistically significant. Have you thought about doing any kind of multiple hypothesis testing there? Yeah, so we definitely need to do that. That's on the list of, of things to do. Um, but they are both significant at the 5% the level, and there's there's 14 different categories. So maybe, yeah, we'd expect one Um but they're both they both also happen to be in exactly the categories that we kind of would have expected to be the most flexible. Um, there are other categories that maybe are like miscellaneous that might be a little more flexible in theory, but like the average spending on miscellaneous is much, much lower than the average spending on cash contributions or on apparel. Um, and so the fact that they are in the exact kind of categories that you might expect there to be a response in, uh, we think is like some sort of reason to to believe the results, but yeah, no, a multiple hypothesis test is definitely on our, our list of things to do. Great, I think we're about out of time, so I'll kick it back to see. Uh, yes, I think I'm just gonna ask one quick question from the audience. So, uh, Cyril Christian asked. Uh, how transparent is the use of spending of the space, the taxes collected uh, by the government? Um, are there any earmarking or spe for specific use of the taxes? I guess uh, it's not like directly related, but it's uh, about uh, the tax collection. <laughs> yeah, I say for the most part, I don't know, I can't say this for sure for every state, but I know for the most mm -hmm. part in most states, cigarette taxes are uh, collected and go to just general revenue. They're not earmarked for specific like anti uh, 
uh, smoking uh, like policies. But I, I do believe there are some states that do earmark the funds. So um, I, I can't say that like holistically for all of the states that we look at over the time period of, of 26 years. But uh, for the most part, I think the answer to that is no, the funds are not earmarked specifically for a, a specific use. Thank you. I think we're about time. So I'll turn it to uh, Darni to take us out. Thank you. We are out of time. However, if you still have burning questions or thoughts for Samuel's term, you can join us for the Top of the Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following select Tops events this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once this event concludes. We'll leave this webinar room open for an extra minute after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL, which is bitbit.ly forward slash tops meeting, T-O-P-S meeting, all lowercase. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, Thank you to the audience of 130 people for your participation. Have a top-notch weekend.